who's ready to receive from the Lord this morning. Praise the name of Jesus. The title of today's message, this, this last week has been incredible. I mean, it's had its ups and downs many times, you know, life sometimes has curveballs. Um, but praise God, when you're in the will of God, it doesn't matter what kind of curveballs are thrown at your way. You know that you're in the right place. When God's with you, it doesn't matter what type of storm comes against your way. Come on, can I get an amen? amen. Um, praise God, and it's been beautiful. The last we had an, uh, a rise on Wednesday night was incredible. I mean, I'm there. That's why I'm obviously bringing this up. Um, it's a beautiful thing. We had it last Wednesday. It was powerful. And then we had something called Night Watch, which is not just, yeah. <laughs> what is this guy talking about, Night Watch? It's not Game of Thrones. <laughs> So it has nothing to do with Jon Snow or none of these crazy guys. But anyways, <laughs> the night watch is at night, though. And uh, we started, it was supposed to be from 12 o'clock. Well, we, we used to do this all the time in church. It's, uh, it's, it's, in Spanish, it's called a vigilia. How do you call it in English, vigilia? No, a vigil. Yeah, I've never used that word. My whole life here in this church is more Hispanic. Yo lo llamo, we call it vigilia. Anyway, that's basically you pray for long periods of hours. We prayed for the nation, prayed for so many different topics. It was amazing. We hadn't done it since pre-COVID, so we're bringing it back. This is actually not just a young adult thing. This is a, an English church thing that we're going to be doing every single month. So you guys are all welcome to come to the next one. We had it Friday, um, and it was such a blessing. Oh, my God. We were supposed to be from 12 to 2, and we are here till like 4 in the morning, 4.15. And we were praying and praying, and the Spirit of God just fell, and we were just, the presence was, it's a, it's a different ball game. So, I mean, it was just, it's been beautiful. When, when, you, when you're with God in the presence of God, you know, that's where, that's where true change occurs. The presence of God shifts everything. Uh, there's no fear in the presence of God. There's healing in the presence of God. There's peace in the presence of God. There's hope. There's faith. There's everything. You are in another dimension. And the enemy doesn't even play with you when you're in the presence of God. And there's times, you know, obviously God lives in us, but there's times that we get distracted with certain things. And it's a beautiful thing not only to, you know, once you're in his presence and pray for the nation, pray for your neighbors, pray for your family, praying for things that aren't <clears throat> all that personal uh, you know, a lot of times when, when, we, when we say a prayer to God, it's like, God, help me. Help me do this. Help my family. Help my this. What about other people that you don't know? You know, sometimes it's nice to be, have that prayer as well. So we did all that. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to sell it to you, even though it's already being sold. I hope you guys all get there come the next month. But um, it's amazing. It's one of those experiences that's a life-changing experience, seriously. Um, you get deep into things and people get delivered and, uh, and, and God reveals things to you. And obviously you don't need to come to a night watch to do that. You can do that from anywhere in the world. Amen. God's everywhere. Praise the Lord. But I just want to bring that up to you, how amazing it's been and how we've gotten deep into prayer. Yesterday we met with a lot of the leaders as well. Um, we all had like three hours of sleep from the, from the night watch because obviously we ended up going home Saturday morning. We met with leaders yesterday and... Praise God, man. It's so good to just, we were just talking about God and the wonderful things he's done in our lives. And, and when, when you're in the right direction with God, it's a beautiful thing. It's not always easy, but you know you're on the right direction. You're on the boat with God. It's like, you know what, even though it's raining, even though it's stormy, Jesus is on our boat. And that's where I'm getting to today. The, today's message is called Absolute Confidence. Mark 4. 35 through 41. The day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Let us go over to the other side, meaning let's get on this boat. Prior to this, prior to verse 35, before I continue to read, Jesus was preaching to the multitudes like he does. He does in parables. He preaches to the multitudes. Then he puts his disciples to the side. He said, oh, let's get on this boat. Let's go to the other side. You with me? Say amen, church. Amen. Verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Verse 37, 
a furious squall came up. So now they're on the boat with Jesus. Twelve disciples getting on the boat. Jesus is on the boat. And let's go to the other side. Right when they're heading to the other side, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Before I get to verse 38, let me tell you what a, what a squall means. Let's go down to the definition of squall. Where are you at? I put it here. Praise the Lord. Squall. I know I have it here. It was a storm. Call him up. You can be. Oh, say amen, church. I'm going to find it. Come on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh-huh. Man, where did I put this squall word in the name of Jesus? We're going to find you, brother. Dun, 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 dun. It has to be here. Man. Bueno. I guess I didn't copy paste it. Basically, a squall is a big storm that comes out of nowhere. Strong gust of winds. It's basically a sudden strong gust of wind. We're with me, right? Sorry about that squall. Well, if I find it later, I'll give you the exact Webster's Dictionary of it. But we're all together, and that's the point. Bam, a squall showed up. The furious squall came up. Waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So this is a bad situation. Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Verse 39, he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Verse 40, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Verse 41, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, have your way in this place. Remove me, Lord, and take total control. Use me as your vessel for your people in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father God, Lord, for the next 25 to 30 minutes, Father, you will be glorified, exalted, and lives will be changed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Life can't get any better than having church, right? I'm sure many of you have heard this story before. This is Church 101 story. And if you haven't, I'm glad this is the first time because we're all going to learn something new whether you've heard it before or not. Life can't get any better than when you're here at church. Pretend we're all here at church. We have a great word. Praise the Lord. And then later, I take a couple, 12 of us. Hey, come here. And I pretend I'm Jesus. Obviously, I'm not. But it, and then Jesus comes. Hey, come here. Let's... You know, we're filled with the fire of God. We just finished a great sermon. Now we're, we're, Jesus tells you to do something. You obey him. He says, let's go to the other side. I'm going, let's, let's go to the other side. <clears throat> they obeyed. They got on the boat. Now you're obedient to God. How good are you feeling when you're in the perfect will of God? And not only are you obedient, but God, Jesus, is on the boat with you. Psh, oh, come on. We're all getting on the boat. Who's not going to get on the boat? We will all get on the boat. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Amen. We're right after church. Then now we are in a beautiful state. We're with God. We're here. We're with Jesus on the boat. And I'm in the perfect will of God. This is the best place as Christians we can all be. We're not sinning. We're doing our job. Praise the Lord. It's all good. Life is good. Can I get an amen? amen? The disciples were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. But while they were on the boat, in the perfect will of God, a problem occurs. Suddenly, a squall. Later, I'm going to find that definition, but we all know what it is. Gusts of wind, huge waves, the boat's filled with water. These people are freaking out. They're caught in the storm while they're in the will of God. 
So this is also another thing. First of all, we're not all called to judge. Never, we does not ever judge anyone. But this is also another reason why God tells us, first of all, judging, we're God's the only judge. But why do I bring up judging? Because a lot of people judge people based off of how wet they look or how dirty their boat may look. Or if their boat looks like it's about to sink. Their storm, their problems, their issues. Just because someone is facing something doesn't mean they're not in the perfect will of God. Never judge, never criticize. Because I could be on the boat with Jesus and I'm about, I feel like I'm about to die. That's what happened to the disciples. The only difference between you can be in the will of God and go through a storm and you can also be out of the will of God and go through a storm. What's the only difference? The disciples were being obedient. Being obedient. Right? They're on the boat with them and they obeyed God. So just because you're going through a storm doesn't mean you're not in the perfect will of God, church. Had to parenthesis. I wanted to put that in a parenthesis. Okay? They obeyed God. They were in the perfect will of God. They're on the way to the other side, and there's a big storm, heavy storm. They were fearful for their lives. I want to get to now three different type of storms that occur in our lives. And in this case, three different type of storms that also occurred in this story. The first type of storm is called a circumstantial storm. They were on the boat, and these circumstances that were occurring, you see, they had no way of doing anything about it. They, they couldn't, you cannot control a circumstantial storm. You're in the boat with God, you're, you're following the will of God, all of a sudden you get hit with something that was out of your control. All of a sudden, a squall came up, boom, and the waves broke nearly, they, and, and the waves got on the boat, and it was swamped, the boat was, was swamped. You can't do anything about this type of storm. How many of you have ever been through some type of storm like that? I know I have. I know you guys in the internet, for sure some of you have been. Things that are just completely out of your control. There's nothing you can do about certain circumstantial storms that sometimes occur in life. The circumstantial storms, we have no power over. We can't do anything about that. The waves came. They can't control the waves. You may have a report from the doctor. You may all of a sudden, some, maybe there's an actual hurricane that comes and destroys something that you've worked so hard for. I don't know. But there's circumstantial storms that occur in life and it happens. It happened to the disciples. It happens to all of us. There's things that you sometimes have no control over. Now, what we, you can't change certain circumstances when it comes to this type of storm. But you do have control on how you react to them. You see, it got real quiet when I said that part. How do you react when a circumstantial storm comes your way? What type of attitude do you have towards it? How do you react? Amen. Trust. That's a great one. That's a great word. But not everybody reacts that way not everyone trusts God when there is a storm a circumstantial storm not many of us have the confidence absolute confidence to trust God when they go through this and not everyone reacts the same and you see, that's why we come to church. This is why we're here. This is why we keep believing and have, you know, we're strengthening our faith. Amen. Praise the Lord. The faith comes, uh, faith comes by hearing the word and you got to continue to feed yourselves because the circumstantial storms will happen in life. And we need to realize and be equipped to how we adapt and how we react to that. But now it leads me to storm number two. You got the first one, right, church? Say amen. Circumstantial storms number one. Then number two, a storm of emotions. They were terrified 
emotional disability. Scared about the doc report. Scared about the financial problems. Scared about the relational problems. They allowed a negative situation that they had no control over to negatively affect their reaction, the outcome. Now they were dealing with a personal, emotional storm. Emotional crisis. They overreacted. How many of you know people that overreact? No one in here. None of us in here. Overreacting. Let's look at the definition of overreacting. That I do have, okay? That's here. <laughs> overreacting definition, number one, to respond more emotionally or forcibly than is justified. An example, they... they <clears throat> They are urging people not to overreact to the problem. Number two, point number two is to react to something too strongly. To respond to something with too strong an emotion or with unnecessary or excessive action. I was furious and I yelled at him. I think we all have fallen on that before. Let's not be, you know. I have definitely have been guilty of that before. I have definitely overreacted many times in my life. Okay, it's quiet, but you know what I'm talking about, church. Come on. Can we, can we be real? Not just such times that you overreact and you're like, God, forgive me, Lord. Sorry, I should have never done that. Some that's not as big of a deal as what, you know, certain other areas. There's always different areas in your life how you can react to things. We're talking about problems here, big problems. And obviously, that's a problem, too. If you're always overreacting, you got to work on yourself and pray. And every time that happens and you get that urge, hey, give me a second and go pray. <laughs> Come on. I'm not the only one here. You know, and with time, you get better. And Jesus will heal you. And Jesus will calm the storm, calm the emotion. There's times that you, you know, especially if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Glory be to God. There's nothing wrong with sometimes having, you, you, you know, just you have to, what you have to do is control that. We have a flesh. Now I'm kind of talking about something else. But it all relates to the same, to the same thing. Look what it says here. Look at the synonyms. To get upset over nothing. React disproportionately. Get overexcited. Go too far. Act irrationally. Lose one's sense of proportion. Exaggerate. Gente que están exagerando. People that exaggerate. Make something out of nothing. Blow something up all out of proportion. I'm sure not anyone here, but for sure you know someone that, <laughs> that falls into this category. Sometimes people blow things out of proportion. Listen, our emotions is something we need to deal with. It's something that we have to put in the feet of the cross. We have to make sure God helps us with that. Why? Because what happens is now I'm going to get my, to my next point later. But what happens when you overreact? This is, this is very important, church. Those of you watching me live as well, pay attention. When you overreact, you're not thinking clear. We're not in the right state of mind. When someone's overreacting, you're not thinking clearly. You blow things out of proportion. You're in an emotional disarray. You have, in other words, lost your cool. When you lose your cool, that's a problem. You don't want to lose your cool. Sometimes we lose our cool. But we can't allow, we can't let, especially a big situation, allow us to make and not have our mind clear and focused. Because when that happens, you know what? Overreaction also causes you to change your perspective. Your perspective, meaning your point of view, shifts. Just because one thing didn't go your way, something that you had no control over doesn't go your way. You get emotionally, you get emotionally distressed. You get 
all blowing things out of proportion. You allow your emotions to control your mind and your thoughts. And all of a sudden, when you overreact in this manner, now you change your perspective. Once you change your perspective, now you have lost control of your mind and you begin to panic. You see, one little thing leads to another. And in the beginning, it probably wasn't a big deal. But how many people do you know that have gotten into some really bad fights? Marriages have been messed up because of it. Many friendships, relationships, jobs, because of something so small, and it blew up out of proportion. And then later on, there's regrets, there's doubt, and all that. From something that could have been fixed if you had a clear mind. Can we get an amen? Amen. Put your hands together if you believe it. That's the truth. We all need to work on that. But what we don't want is to panic. Because then what happens, you see, now the enemy begins to infiltrate. We're going step by step. You're with me, church. Say amen again. Good. Because we're getting somewhere. The enemy wants you to panic. The enemy wants you to overreact. The enemy wants you to think emotionally. We see it every single day. And you know what? The enemy has the ability to influence our exterior situations. We as Christians, you The body of Christ that has surrendered your life to Christ, that has Jesus Christ dwelling in them, the spirit of the living God lives in you. You can never be possessed by the devil, by Satan. You cannot. Praise God. Give yourselves a round of applause. Those of you that have Jesus and that have surrendered their lives to him. You cannot be possessed, but you can be oppressed. What the heck does that mean? Well, you can get influenced by exterior situations and circumstances. The disciples did. I have so I there's many times where I get in where I allow exterior things to influence the way I react. It happens. And this is what the enemy wants. He has Satan has Satan has power on this earth. He'll never have more power than God. Chill with that. Never. We're covered. But that doesn't mean that there's not influences out there. You can see it every day on the news. Just turn on the news. Look what's happening. You'll run across something, some negative situation you have no control over, and all this, you get bombarded with all this negativity. There's there's evil forces that want to destroy you. Look what it says here in John 15, 19. In the English Standard Version, it says, If you were of the world... The world would love you as it, as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. What does he mean by the world? He's talking about the satanic pleasures, the flesh, all of that that have nothing to do with the spirit of God. Those negative influences, that's the world. The world doesn't like the fact that you're a Christian. That's why the Bible talks about those storms. There's going to be a storm. The enemy wants to throw something at you so that you bow your knee. You allow the situation to get the better of you instead of you asking God to take care of it. The enemy uses this exterior situations to negatively affect your reaction when you overreact it changes your perspective once you change your perspective you change your point of view you begin to lean and believe on something other than what God said and now leads me to my third point my third type of storm and this is the enemy's plan all from the beginning and this third type of storm is a spiritual storm this third type of storm is a spiritual storm a theological storm if you will they woke up jesus and said jesus do you not care they literally went with jesus woke him up said jesus we're all about to die what are you doing sleeping 
Jesus wakes up. Woo! Before I get to that part, I'm getting excited. Let me, so let me backtrack a little bit. Once they went up to Jesus and woke him up, and think about it. Let's pretend, let's all pretend we're on this boat with Jesus. We're crossing through, you know, to make it to the other side. We're on a boat. We're on the ocean. And all of a sudden, this thing happens. This crazy storm happens. We're all freaking out. We don't want to die. We feel like something bad. Jesus is, but where's Jesus? Jesus is sleeping? No way. He can't be sleeping. I'm going to get to this point now. They go, they wake him up. Once they did that, right there, that's already a sign of questioning God. Why? Not because they woke him up, because what they told him. Do you not care if we live or die? They were questioning God because they were overwhelmed from an exterior situation that messed them up emotionally, mentally. They panicked. They went to God, and they already asked God, wait, what is it, God? Do you not care? If I live or die? Glory be to Jesus. Jesus was asleep on the cushion. Jesus wakes up. First thing Jesus does. He goes straight to the storm. He doesn't talk to his disciples yet. Jesus goes straight to the storm, calms the winds, calms the sea, calms it all, takes care of business. Then after Jesus calms the storm, verse 40, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? So imagine, we're freaking out. We wake up Jesus. Wake up, Jesus. Do you not care that I live or die? Jesus wakes up. He goes outside. He's in the stern. So he comes, he, comes, he comes up. He's on the bottom of, the, of this boat. So he comes up, talks to the winds, talks to the sea, calms it all down. Everything's chill now. So now the disciples, like me and you, are just looking at Jesus like, what? He, then Jesus turns around and says, why are you afraid? Do you not believe? These are the exact words. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why do you think Jesus asked this question? Jesus knows the answer to all the questions, right? It's probably like, hey, man, I thought we were going to die. But you see, the answer to this question is back on verse 35. Right when Jesus said, let us go over to the other side before you even got on the boat. You see, before they even got on the boat, there was a promise. We were going to make it to the other side, regardless of what was going to happen. You see, this is, this is some other level stuff. You can put your hands together. Come on. Clap. And I'm getting to more points now. And God's going to reveal many more things to you guys for sure. Praise the Lord. Let us go to the other side. But when God gives a promise, God never wants your circumstances to overrule his word. God never wants his circumstances to overrule his word. He doesn't want your circumstances to overrule his presence. You see, Jesus was on that boat. And not only was he on the boat, he was in the stern. So the Bible says, well, the stern is like, to say the, the, the dock, the do bottom part. No, not the dock. The, what do you say? Well, whatever. You guys have an idea. You have the top of the boat, and then you have a little, the bottom of the boat. You take the stairs down. So if, water's, if water is coming in, what do you think is going to be flooded first? Yeah, eso. The bottom. And Jesus is still chilling, sleeping. <laughs> I love it. He doesn't want your circumstances to overrule his presence. He is on the boat with you. You can't allow your circumstances to shape or bend your belief. This is very interesting. 
Sometimes when you, when, when you get to this point in your life, you allow circumstances that you have no control over to take over your emotions. And this is why I told you in the beginning how important it is. They made it to the other side, ladies and gentlemen. This is how good our God is. And let me tell you something. We have all been in this situation in our lives like the disciples have. Where we got, well, at least us, us obviously, that are, that are believers. We are on the boat. Jesus, tell, they tell us what to, we have God with us. We're on the boat. We're on the perfect will of God. We hit a storm and something alters our thoughts. We begin to panic. We begin to, you see, Jesus, this is also, I was just diving into this. You say, why was Jesus actually sleeping? You see, Jesus represents, he already knew, it's, it's, he, already, he wanted to see, first of all, the disciples' his faith. I want to be a people that I don't care what type of situation comes my way. I'm going to make it to the other side. I don't care how wet I am because God's with me. But there's times where we do doubt. But we serve such an amazing God. Such a merciful God, such a loving God. It doesn't matter if you doubt him, when you cry out to him, he will wake up and he will calm the storm. It's never too late. He will calm your storm, even when you make the mistake of doubting him. And because you know what? They should have never woke him up. The reason why God was sleeping, I spoke to the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God told me, hey, that's a representation of God. He's your rest. Rest. Go to sleep. You don't even need to stress. Because obviously, crying out to God, but you're already in a state where you're freaking out. I don't want to freak out. I don't want to have my blood pressure up while I'm praying to God. Isn't it much easier just to stay sleeping next to Jesus, and you're going to just, who cares how many, how many storms there are, how wet it is? I want to make it to the other side in peace. Come on, church. Put your hands together if you believe that. But if you already made the mistake, like some people do, and there's going to be other times in our lives where we're going to be on the boat again, another time that we're going to go. This is a journey. We're still breathing. You have the opportunity now. When God gives you another promise, you don't have to go through all that stress, panic, emotional instability. Just go to sleep. What do you mean by go to sleep? I'm not really going to go to sleep. No, that's a representation that God is the one that fights your battles for you. He is our rest. Come on, church. And even if your faith is weak, some of you in here probably have some weak, weak faith. And there's times where situations happen and it just hurts, and we're human. We need God. If we didn't need God, we wouldn't be here. If there, 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 there was no enemy, we wouldn't. Listen, this is that's not how life is. There's going to be storms. Let's put that clear. I always say this all the time, and I'll continue to say it. Don't pray to God to take away the storms. Don't. You don't. Because it's already, it's already established that there's, there's going to be storms. Jesus himself went through a storm with the disciples. The only thing Jesus was is Jesus. And he already knows. Let's go to the other side. When God tells you something, open up that business. Okay, I obeyed God, but now look what's going on. I don't even have money to pay rent. If God told you, rest, he will come through. They'll, he'll make a way where there seems to be no way. If he says you're going to get in that school, you're going to get in that school. Oh, but you don't understand. Chill. My marriage is all messed up. You don't understand this happened. Chill. God is in control. Give it to God. Rest. And if you're in a state right now where you're like the disciples, like I said earlier, call out to God. He'll calm the storm for you. And get you to the other side. The only difference is it would be nice to make it to the other side relaxed, but whatever. <laughs> El punto, eh? The point is, is that you, man, God loves us so much. 
And it's amazing because I know a lot of people right now are receiving this word because it's going to happen again. There's going to be something else that's going to occur in your life. There's going to be another situation, another, you're going to, listen, the bridge, this is the bridge. The, the, okay, so pretend like if you're in one side of what, two bodies of land that are separated by water, what connects them? It's a bridge, Right? You're going to have constant, constant bridges in your life because God's a God of escalation. God wants you to continue to go forward. God does. He wants you to keep crossing, crossing and going up and going up. There's always going to be tests. You may be asking, why is there a storm? Why do I even need a storm? Like, why do I have to face storms? Some of you may be saying that. I'll give you two answers right now. The first answer is a storm is always designed to increase your faith. And you get a bigger, much deeper experience with God. And number two, storms are obviously not present. They may be life-threatening, but they are built for a purpose. There's a purpose behind all of it. You see, like I told you, the two bodies of land, pretend like your life's like that, right? We're here now. There's going to be something over there. Pretend like you're in this body of land, and then there's a big empty space, and there's another body of land. Though life is like that. You have, to comp- you have to get to the other side. There's always another side. How you get there depends on your faith. Faith is the bridge that connects those two separate parcels of land together so that you can make it to the other side. I want to make it relaxed, peacefully. Some of you may be in a situation right now where instead of calling out to God, you've been calling to your friends. Chill with that. Call on God. Stop calling every single doctor in the world. I'm not saying it's bad to go visit doctors or financial advisors, but I promise you what? You will never find a better advisor for your life than the spirit of the living God. Ever. God is the one that's going to show you who to call. God's going to show you what counselor to go visit. God's going to tell you what doctor to go see. The spirit of God's going to tell you who to do business with. The spirit of God's going to tell you... Ah, the answers, man. 